I would like to introduce the sponsor of the bill, the Honorable Senator Yvonne Boyer. And Senator, welcome, and thank you for the tremendous work you do. And we will begin with your opening remarks before we move to questions from members. Senator Boyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you all for being here today and taking time out of your busy committee agenda schedule to listen to these issues. I'll explain what the bill is and its importance. Bill S-250 criminalizes the act of forcing or coercing a person to become sterilized without proper consent. It amends the Criminal Code of Canada by adding Section 281 or 263.1, 68.1, and it clarifies what a sterilization procedure is, and it adds safeguards for consent. In my professional life, I've studied the intersect between health and the law and how it affects the lives of Métis, First Nation, and Inuit. Although sterilization has been interwoven through my academic life since early in my career, I've been actively working in the area of forced and coerced sterilization since 2017, when I was commissioned by the Saskatoon Health Region to conduct an external review of the Saskatoon Health Region's tubal ligation policies. At this time, numerous Indigenous women came forward with the same history of post-Cesarean section and either being forced or coerced into sterilization in the same Saskatoon hospital. The core issue being the lack of consent or coercion to consent to the sterilization. The external review began with the stories of two women, Tracy Banab and Brenda Pelche. Then two more came and then two more and then there were 11. A total of 16 women came forward at that time. However, some chose not to proceed with interviews out of fear and trauma. The report was released on July 11, 2017. This external review lays the basis for the first class action lawsuit led by lawyer Elisa Lombard, who you will hear from in this study. It's my understanding that there are at least five class actions occurring across the country on this topic. In 2017, after the external review was made public, the federal ministerial representative stated in an interview that the issue demands urgent attention, saying it can be very difficult for patients to deal with health care providers who discriminate. Unfortunately, this issue did not get immediate attention, and as a result, many Indigenous women and others have been sterilized after the report was released in 2017. <clears throat> As we completed, <clears throat> after we completed the external review, I have become one of the national voices on this topic. And while the current public discourse around this issue began with the external review, there is documentation of forced and coerced sterilization going back many years and generations, and being part of official policy and eugenic laws in Alberta and BC, and being discussed also in different provinces at various points in history. Early on, I was di directed by the survivors of this horrific practice to create a law that would criminalize sterilization without consent. I was initially reluctant because of the harms that historically have affected Indigenous people within the criminal justice system. But I did introduce the bill after two studies conducted by the, Sen the Standing Senate Committee on Human Rights in 2021 and 2022. The first study brought together the disability community, the intersex community, the black women from Nova Scotia, lawyers, and the government. From that study, we understood, understood just how deep the problems go. The second study, in which we heard directly from survivors of forced sterilization, was one of the most powerful, moving, and heart-wrenching experiences of my time in the Senate. During this study, the survivors were clear and spoke with a unified voice, asking that this horrific practice be criminalized. This bill is a direct response to their calls for action. This bill is also a response to Recommendation 1 from the Senate Standing Committee on Human Rights, the scars that we carry forced and coerced sterilization of persons in Canada. It states that legislation should be introduced to add a specific offence to the criminal code prohibiting forced and coerced sterilization. While many examples of the shocking practice are confidential due to survivors wishing not to share their stories in public, a few examples highlight the importance of this bill and its swift passage. As has been extensively reported on, in 2019, Dr. Andrew Kotaska sterilized without consent a 37-year-old Inuk woman in the Stanton General Hospital in Yellowknife. As some background, Dr. Kataska 
has served as president of the Northwest Territories Medical Association. He has years of practicing medicine as well as professorships at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Toronto, University of Manitoba, and at UBC School of Population and Public Health. He has published articles on caring for Indigenous patients and, surprisingly, informed consent and ethics. Dr. Kataska is the former clinical director of obstetrics at the Stanton Territorial Hospital in Yellowknife. Dr. Kataska's patient had pelvic pain, and she consented to having her right ovary and fallopian tube removed if necessary. While she was in surgery, Dr. Kataska stated, let's see if I can find a reason to take the left one, and he did. He permanently sterilized her. A complaint was lodged with the Northwest Territories Department of Health and Social Services, and a virtual hearing was held. The Board of Inquiry held that he violated the Canadian Medical Association Code of Ethics and Responsibilities. He was suspended for five months, his contract expired, so he had served that, and to pay $20,000 for the legal costs of the hearing and to take an ethics course. He and the Northwest Territories Health Authority are being sued for $6.5 million. He is registered with the Society for Physicians and Surgeons of British Columbia, and I've heard he's now working in the interior of BC. We have all heard of Joyce Echequan, who, as she was dying, video streamed the vicious brutality she suffered at the hands of the racist nurses who taunted her. The inquiry that was held following her death revealed that she'd been sterilized without consent in 2019. In addition, witness A, one of our survivor witnesses who testified at the Senate Standing Committee at the second study, was also sterilized in 2018. She was 24 when she was sterilized. Since I was appointed to the Senate, my office has been known as a safe space for people who have been sterilized without their consent. Over the past six years, I've spoken directly with hundreds of women and some men who have been forced or have been or are currently being or coerced into a sterilization procedure. Some of these survivors were sterilized decades ago and are just discovering what happened to them now. Others call me days or weeks after they were sterilized. Sometimes they call many times, never speaking, until finally they feel comfortable to share their story. The most recent devastating call was over this past Christmas, 2023. And it was another Indigenous mother who was sterilized without consent. At any given time, I have at least one or two people contacting me repeatedly, asking for help. For every example that became a news item after 2017, many more were not reported. This is a real issue that's happening today, as we speak, and it's not one of the past. It's devastating for the Inuk mother, for Joyce Echequan, for the witnesses who told their stories at the Senate, and for all others who are suffering now. I wonder if Bill S-250 had been law, would it have stopped any of this from happening after 2017? Would this bill have created a split-second sober thought before Dr. Kataska sliced off the only remaining fallopian tube of the Inuk woman who now sues him? I believe this bill will make a difference for the women and for the doctors. Throughout this study, you will hear from legal experts, medical professionals, and those directly impacted by forced sterilization. I implore you to listen to their words and how they view these changes. By considering and ultimately passing this bill, the Senate can show it takes the concerns of all people seriously who are in vulnerable states when interacting with the healthcare system. I thank you for your years of support, your time here, and your kind collaboration, and I am happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Senator Boyer. We now go to the critic of the bill, Senator Bills. Thank you very much. Uh Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, Senator Boer, not just for being here today, but for being the champion of this cause, uh, something that uh, many of us didn't know was even uh, on the radar of Canada until we did the studies, which I was a part of uh, at Human Rights Committee, both studies. Um, and I spoke on this in chamber almost a year ago uh, at, uh, at second reading. Senator Boyer, you're proposing additions to the criminal code for which some people say, some critics of your bill, uh, but not this critic of your bill, <laughs> uh, uh, under Section uh, 250, 265, 267, uh, and 268, all which relate to assault or um, assault causing bodily, bodily harm or aggravated assault, 
why should two questions one why have there been no charges under these three provisions of the criminal code and why should an additional layer of criminality be attached uh, specifically for forced sterilization thank you senator wells that's um, a good question and i um if those provisions had have been used i wouldn't be here today and unfortunately they haven't and the research that i've done is that there hasn't been any criminal convictions that have um, resulted from medical procedures um, on reproductive organs there has not been any and um, i think that, uh, that it's important to, to have this bill maybe as a deterrent maybe it would have caused that second thought before that the doctor sterilized that patient I'm I'm hoping that uh, that that's what it will do and I believe that having this bill is going to um, ha has helped the, the survivors they've called for it and called for it and called for it and it isn't just the survivors others have have called the uh, Assembly of First Nations a few years ago in 2019 I believe had asked if I would do this and I said no I said no I wasn't ready I wasn't ready to do something like that and it wasn't until the survivors spoke at the study the second study of the Human Rights Committee that that I said I have to do this I have no choice the women need it the women have been calling for it we need to listen to the survivors they're the ones that know because they're the ones that have undergone the surgery so that's Thank why you, it's Senator important. Board. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wills. Senator Batters, Vice, Pres Vice Chair of this committee. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, and thank you, Senator Boyer, for being here. I want to follow up on, on that line of questioning a bit um, because just so that people who are watching this understand um, those criminal code sections that Senator Wells referred to um, 265 is assault, 267 is assault causing bodily harm, 268 is aggravated assault. All of those are currently in the criminal code, could potentially be used to, um, to prosecute cases of forced sterilization. Um, and just, you know, um, looking at, at your bill, um, so um, one thing that's very clear is by proceeding, if this bill was to pass, um, by proceeding through this bill rather than those types of um, offenses that already exist and have you know decades of case law and um, jurisprudence on them under this bill there are increased things that um, a prosecutor needs to prove um, beyond reasonable doubt to have this criminal offense that would be a new criminal offense proven um, it would have to prove that it's part of a sterilization procedure under the definition that's under your bill other types of things that would have to be proven that it wasn't with consent all of these um, sorts of things in very particular ways that are additional things that could potentially make it more difficult actually to obtain a criminal conviction um, under your bill than under those sections um, that I previously mentioned. So given that, do you think that that's um, a concern, is having all of those um, you know, different difficult things to prove for both police are going to have to um, delve into those in investigating and then prosecutors are going to have to prove them and a judge and, and or jury will have to uh, find that that has happened. Th thank you, Senator Batters, for the question. and. And thank you for the opportunity to go over that as well. Um, under the assault provisions, uh, 265, 267, 268, and all of the provincial and territorial mechanisms do require consent to medical procedures as well. Um, we haven't found anything. There hasn't been any case law specifically on women being sterilized in, in those cases. Um, I do believe that bringing the attention that this sterilization aspect of 268.1 would bring would be enough to deter it would be enough to have the doctors think about when they're in surgery do I not need consent to remove that other fallopian tube should I stop it and take that sober second thought and and get the proper informed consent I agree that the um, 
that it's that it's important to have this section in the criminal code specifically for sterilization because it has been such a problem and it hasn't been just a problem specifically just for indigenous women we found that it's also a problem for the disability community it's a problem for intersex people the black women from Nova Scotia that testified testified of over 200 women that had hysterectomies and is that necessary or is is something like this important to really take a second thought about the sterilization aspect of that surgery. So um, I think, I, I do believe this bill is important. It needs to be passed. And I, uh, if, if the other provisions within the criminal code had have been used, then I wouldn't be here today either. Thank you. Um, another question that I have, Senator Boyer, is uh, so I see that under your bill, um, subsection two. Senator Daly, may I put you on second round? Sure. Yes. Thank you. Senator Dalfour. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, merci uh, beaucoup, uh, Senatrice Boyer, d'être avec nous ce matin. Et merci surtout d'avoir pris en main cette cause importante. Uh, thanks to you, uh, things have been changed, evolving. Class actions have been filed. The College of Medicines have been reacting and uh, even agreeing to provide more training. So what you did is an eye-opener for many, many of us and outside. Thank you very much. My question is about more technical. It's about the content of the bill as such. Um, in terms of legal impact, I, I assume you have not consulted with the Justice Department or with some... Uh, Legal officials about it, or the, the Crown's uh, office. Or? The the law clerk, um, the law clerk's office. I have I have definitely consulted with them, and uh, had gone back and forth with them on a number of issues about this. Because the first thing was, should this actually be included in the aspect, the same um, section as female genital mutilation? That is something that was seriously considered, and no, uh, it shouldn't because the aspect of sterilization is so far reaching and wide and that it needed to have a section of its own. That was one of the areas that, that uh, I had kind of struggled with. And also, where, where else to put it? Should it be in the assault provisions? Um, that was another issue that the, the law clerk and I had gone over with several times. But this is what we ended up with. If, um, uh, if any, anybody thinks there should be some other amendments, I'm happy to look at them, and uh, I, I can, um, I'd be happy to look at them and see if there's any way we can make this even stronger. My question is more directed to about: Did you consult for uh, uh, lawyers that are specializing in criminal offenses, like for either for the crown or for defense, just to make sure that the technical aspects are sometimes tricky? Yes, I've I've consulted with class action specialists on this. So there's, we've, we've had, uh, I've had a number of, of people looking at this with me. Lawyers, thank you. Uh, one of the proposed crime, it will be the last subsection seven. It's called coerced sterilization. And it's not directed to those that the, the doctors or the, uh, the, per the person that performed the, the sterilization procedures. It's directed to the person that may have induced the request for sterilizations and to uh, coerce the person to get into that process. So that's what they understand. So uh, it's a different it's a different crime than the the main crime, which is to perform the 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 things without having the proper consent. Correct. Yes, and I can give you an example of that. Um, with uh, and this is, uh, this is public, this is not confidential, what I'm saying, is that uh, there was um, one of the women that we had interviewed for the external review had uh, been told by the nursing staff and the health professionals that uh, she, uh, as a, her, first, her first child had cerebral palsy. She was, being, she was told that she needed to be sterilized for her second one and she was about to deliver. And um, she didn't want to sign the consent form. She was so reluctant to sign the consent form because she, she wanted to have more children. But she was told by the healthcare professionals that 
if she didn't sign the consent form, that that second baby could quite possibly have cerebral palsy as well. So um, that, uh, that was something that may fall within this section. So she did sign it. She did sign it because she didn't want her second baby to have cerebral palsy. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My time is up, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, please. Thank you. You want second round, Senator? Uh, Senator Canyon. <coughs> oui, ma question porte euh, sur la stérilisation en, tra- en tant que telle. Quand je... Quand, peut-être c'est une version française versus anglaise, là, mais euh, dans la version euh, française, on parle surtout de manière chirurgicale. Mais euh, je crois comprendre que il y a des façons, euh, avec notamment des produits chimiques, de, stéri- de faire de la stérilisation euh, féminine, masculine aussi. Là. Euh, Et si c'est interdit de façon chirurgicale, euh, mais peut-être que ça va ouvrir la porte justement à utiliser les méthodes chimiques. Euh, est-ce que vous avez, est-ce que ça a été, euh, est-ce que c'est passé? Parce que en anglais, je ne sais pas pourquoi, là, il y a A et B, <rire> ce qu'il n'y a pas en, en français, là, mais uh, « Any other act perform on a person for the primary purpose so, ». Peut-être que ça entre là-dedans, mais en français, c'est vraiment pas évident que cette notion-là ait été inclue. Euh, avez-vous, est-ce que vous avez pensé à ça? <laughs> no, I haven't thought about it, but that's very good and that needs to be clarified because there is such a thing as chemical castration. Yeah. And that's something that possibly, um, you know, we could look at amending this and making sure that both the French and English are coinciding exactly. So um, I... I'll make sure that, it, that that's looked into. OK, peut-être je euh, vais ça. L'autre, l'autre point, euh, je vois pas de... Normalement, dans les situations ou les cas où on a des victimes euh, et que la victime s'est principalement basée sur euh, agression sexuelle, euh, des, des, des éléments de, de, de vraiment vie privée, là... Euh, Il y a un article dans le Code qui permet des ordonnances de non-publication. Donc, euh, je ne vois pas que vous modifiez euh, cet article-là pour euh, pouvoir garder euh, confidentiel euh, le nom de la victime lorsqu'il y a une accusation. Est-ce que c'est ça aussi une adaptation à faire? C'est quelque chose que... J'imagine que vous voulez protéger aussi la, la confidentialité de la victime lorsque ça arrive. Là. C'est peut-être un oubli, je ne sais pas. Mm-hmm. Definitely. We'll, we'll definitely have a look at that. That's a good point. Thank you for raising it. And I'll, I'm actually going to follow up with you. OK. OK, thank Merci. you. Ça met deux points. Senator Carter and then Senator Breed. Senator Carter. Uh, Thanks very much. Uh, Senator Boyer and I knew each other as uh, young people growing up in Moose Jaw. We knew each other as Yvonne and Brent. Um, uh, In this context, Senator Boyer, you're a hero to me and to so many others for your leadership on this question. I have two sets of questions. One really follows up on uh, Senator Delfond. In the federal government's response to the Senate Report Part 2, uh, it indicate that indicated that the government was following closely this bill, and it indicated that the Minister of Justice, I'm reading from it now, the Minister of Justice has met with the sponsor of the bill, I presume that was you, and has committed to working with her on this item. Has there been any development along those lines? Uh, and, and Senator Delfond, I think, implicitly is making the point that your leadership on this would be meaningfully enriched if the government made a commitment and uh, maybe even introduced a government bill and the thing would move more uh, rapidly. Can you give us any sense of that? Yes. Minister Lametti and I had talked uh, at great depth about this bill. Same with uh, Minister Miller. And and they were both very, very supportive of it. And um, I think that the... um, the support their support is important but i think it's this bill this bill was directed to me from the survivors the survivors are number one they told me to do this i don't want the government to do this i want to do this for the survivors 
So that's that's critical. That's critical. But and and the, and the government never said that they wanted to take it over either. They said that they're supportive. They will they will help me. They will do whatever they need to do, and um, and that's kind of where we're at right now. Is is we have we have the support of the government, and I'm I'm pleased about that. Could I have time for a somewhat more technical question? Um, issues around consent to um, what would otherwise be assaults um, exists in d different components of the criminal law, some of which were already referred to. Um, this produces a somewhat more elaborate way of assessing consent. Um, it might create the problem Senator Batters identified. It might produce protections that are not otherwise there. Um, can you say how, how well or, or differently this approach to consent aligns with other dimensions of consent, such as in the context of sexual assaults? And secondly, how does the proposed sanction here uh, line up with other kinds of sanctions for forms of, of, of physical assault okay. of a serious Th nature? Thank you for that question. Um, that, that was one of my questions, is why 14 years? And that aligns with many um, penalizations within the criminal code itself. It's actually mentioned 83 times within the criminal code. And it's, um, it aligns with female genital mutilation as well. And I think that's probably why the, it settled on 14 years. And I'm sorry, what was the first question you had? How con consent, you know, oh. there's an elaborate con construct, construct for okay. achieving consent here. How well does that align with other situations of consent that are addressed in the criminal law, criminal code for assaults of, of a serious nature? Right, okay. So um, can, the consent here was developed from what we heard and what we saw. With the women, uh, what, what was missing for when you have an Indigenous family that's been affected by a, um, a something like like a sterilization. You're not dealing with one individual. You're dealing with generations of individuals. Th this type, this the consent that we find in here is specific to a complex sort of life that has been colonized and um, and been subjected to all of the aspects of racism within the healthcare system. So what we what we come out here with with consent is it's like it's four pillars of consent. It's four pillars that that are really important about assessing what capacity is, capacity of the human being that's giving consent and looking at all of the risks and the consequences of that particular type of of consent. Like if if a patient comes into to the doctor saying, you know, I'm I'm I want to have a tubal ligation, and the doctor says, "Okay, I'm going to tell you all of the aspects of what could wh what you could do instead." There's birth control. There's other types of contraception. There are um, there needs to be proper time as well for that patient to assess what the doctor is saying, not in between contractions, which has happened when the doctor says, oh, I'm just going to get consent in between contractions while she's panting. So, you know, the altered state just doesn't do it. Um, there also has to be not um, coercion. Like somebody, a patient goes into into the doctor's office and says, um, you know, I'm here for my checkup, and the doctor says, well, wouldn't you like to have a tubal ligation? So the, the aspect about this bill that's a little bit different is that the doctor's not allowed to mention it. The, 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 it has to be voluntarily. Like, the patient's going to come in and say, I want a tubal ligation, not do you want a tubal ligation. So I think it's a little bit different. This, uh, the aspects of consent within this bill is different than what you find in other aspects of of the consent requirements within the criminal code. Thanks, that's very helpful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Fate and then Senator Clement. Senator Fate. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Boyer. And I'm going to ask, uh, expand 
ask you to expand a bit upon what some others have asked, and basically it's a conversation you and I have already had, not in this, in this venue. Um, we all know and struggle, particularly when we're talking about issues that involve uh, what are essentially violence against women, and in particular violence against Indigenous women, with the use of the law, uh, partly because it provides a standard of what the behaviour we expect from people, in this case medical professionals, um, and then the penalty piece. And as we've discussed, um, I'm really, uh, and, and oftentimes the victims of violence, the only thing they can think of or the only thing that is ever offered up is criminal law reform. And for us as senators, it's one of the few areas we can impact. And so I, I'd want to provide, you know, an opportunity for you to discuss more some of the other options you looked at. And in particular, how we deal with the very real, you mentioned Joyce Eshaquan, and how we deal with the very real racism and misogyny that may prevent people from ever being criminalized in this context because doctors will have resources to lawyer up, there'll be professional standards bodies that will lawyer up, um, and in my humble opinion, I really worry that this becomes another slap at women because people may not end up criminalized and in fact it may end up um, causing you know additional harms and and then I also want if you're comfortable commenting on the um, su the suggestion Native Women's Association of Canada also suggested that free prior and informed consent be the UN declaration model be the f the model that's used um, so I'm, I'm conscious of you know Joyce was you know while she was being treated brutally and inhumanely, other people in that same hospital were being treated appropriately. And and so how do we get at some of those sorts of issues? And I know you've mentioned mm -hmm. the deterrent value and that's exactly the part of the role of criminal law. Um, but what are some of the other mechanisms that you think need to be put in place that this may help propel? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pate. Um, on the issue of free prior and informed consent, that's the first thing I brought up to the law clerk. I said, I want free prior and informed consent right through here because uh, it means it's something different. It's something different than what we see in the criminal code. And, um, and I was told that the issue of free prior and informed consent does not, it, it's already implied in there. So, I mean, if I could, if I could put it in, I would. Um, so maybe um, uh, Senator Carino and I can talk about that. Um, anyway, I, uh, some of the other things that, that I've been working on before I even got to wanting to do this bill was um, I, when I became a senator, my, my initial speech was about forced sterilization. It's been part of my life since I was a little girl, but not uh, in, the, in the center of, of what... Um, I'm I'm in right now, and if I tell you if I tell you this the story of how it all happened, I think I should. Um, so I was sitting. Um, I was a Canada Research Chair in Aboriginal Health and Wellness at Brandon University, and I had often been outspoken about uh, issues that affected Indigenous people, and particularly with health, because my work has been on the studying the intersect between health and the law. And I received a phone call from um, Betty Ann Adam at the Star Phoenix, who said, there's two women in my office that uh, have said that they've been sterilized against their will. And I, um, I want to know what you say about that. And I said, well, that's against the law. There's assault provisions. There's uh, Aboriginal law. There's international law. It's in, uh, against inherent law. And I, would, I went on and on. And, uh, and she said, OK. And then she published the first... The first um, article about it and then and that was Tracy Benav and Brenda Palche and they came forward and then as I said many more women came forward and so I started thinking like how are we going to stop this like this is crazy and I can't I can't it's like many of you it's like didn't that happen in the past and like why is that happening today so um I I started thinking about what you know when is this going to stop? And then I got a phone call from the Saskatoon Health Authority, and they said to me, 
um, I, we want you to do an external review on our tubal ligation policies. And I said, well, you know, I've been bad-mouthing you all across the country. Here's four or five interviews about what I'm saying about you guys. And they said, no, the elders asked for you. And I said, okay, if the elders asked for me, I will, I will come talk to you and consider it. And I had... I had a few things that I, the only reason I, I did that was because I wanted to make sure that the report was public after, that I could bring, I would have the resources that I needed to, to do a proper job, and I would have somebody with me that knew the hospital. I was an old operating room nurse, so I know the culture of the hospital. I had Dr. Judy Bartlett with me, who was a Métis physician. We both knew the hospital culture, and we, we worked together, and we put the external review together, and we... We had a helper with us that spoke Cree because the first language is Cree. And we went to the Cashman areas of the Saskatoon, of the Saskatoon Health Authority, which is, you know, a huge 300,000 uh, population. And uh, we put up uh, requests in bingo halls, health, health, health areas, health departments, in the stores, and we had people calling us with a Cree speaker on the other line, and this is how we were able to talk to these women and get the stories of what was actually going on. And, and so that was, that was the beginning. That was the heart. That was the heart and soul. We had an elder with us, uh, Elder Mary Lee from Saskatoon, who's well-known. She's a Cree elder, and we had her help with the interviews. And, and it was so traumatic, listening to the women who had been so traumatized, it was so traumatic. Every morning, the three of us would pray. We would hold hands and we would pray for the strength to get through that day to help these women. And then when the women fell apart being interviewed, Mary would go in and hug them and say, I'm going to hug you back together. And she would hold them until they stopped crying and then we could carry on with the interview. And that's how all of this began. And so, and that's how this bill began. And, and so, when I came to the Senate, it was my first speech. My first speech was about sterilization, and then I thought, well, here I am, I'm a senator, I'm going to go talk to the government, and I'm going to find out why, why we're still seeing this happening. So I did, I had meetings with the government, meeting after meeting after meeting, and they tried, they, they put together their uh, Indigenous advisory group, and then they told me we're going to do culturally relevant education. I'm thinking, well, who's going to stop the cutting? And, and so I'm getting these answers that I'm, I'm not quite not really quite getting it because I never worked for the government before. I didn't know how their hands could be tied, but they were working with the national Aboriginal organizations who were representing the survivors, but they, they weren't representing survivors. They were, they were representing their, their, their contingent, their constituents. And so the, the, the sterilizations kept going. They, they kept coming on, they kept going and and I'm feeling like I'm getting nowhere. And then I, uh, I actually met with uh, Elisa Lombard, who you're going to be um, hearing from shortly. And her and I said, okay, let's, let's, we've got to figure out a way to give all of these survivors a voice. So we put together a, um, a we, we put together a nonprofit corporation. And we had the objectives laid out by them, we met with them on Zoom all across the country with over 200 women by this time we've now gathered. So we put together the, the, um, the nonprofit corporation and it became the Survivor Circle for Reproductive Justice. And you're also going to hear a board member today as well about this. And then finally the women can speak for themselves, they can speak with one unified voice, they can go for funding, and they were able to access some government funding now, so that there's things I'm hoping will, will turn a little bit. Um, this bill is w one, one aspect of a huge, of, of a huge national strategy that has to occur. The strategy has to also occur, and maybe it can come through the, the nonprofit corporation, but we need to be doing some data gathering, some real hardcore data gathering. My office has done the best they can, and we have, I mean, I've met with, my personally, I've met with hundreds, 
well, probably 200 or more uh, people that have been sterilized, men and women, and um, the office has also gathered research information of 12,000 people that have been sterilized. So, um, so we've, but a lot of that's anecdotal information. We need a national data gathering center. We there's there's many things that we need to look at the whole um, aspect of reproductive injustice. And that's part of it. So yes, I've been working hard in other areas as well. And the, the bill is one area that I think is very, very important. And it's um, something that the survivors have, have asked for. And it's been um, the recommendation number one of the second study of the Senate Standing Committee on Human Rights. So thank you for asking. You, Senator Boyer, Senator Clement, and then Sen Senator Klein. Senator Clement. Senator Boyer, thank you for that. Answer. That's very powerful and difficult to hear. The a criminal code is a um, difficult place. It, um, it it includes a lot of sections that are already supposed to be used to combat issues. But we know that those sections are not used sometimes, especially um, when we're talking about systemic racism. The bail reform bill that we just went through, we amended, adding a section to force judges to include in the record of proceedings that they considered the background of the accused, the vulnerable populations, because it was already there, but they weren't doing it. So I understand your point about it's not efficient in terms of how the criminal code operates, but I understand your point about making a specific reference so that you're, you're speaking to the systemic discrimination. Can you, can you lean into your hesitation? You know, you hesitated because this is not a safe space for criminal justice system is not a safe space for women, for indigenous women, for black women. Can you lean into your hesitation around that? And then the second piece of the question would be, how have, how have other communities like the disability community you referenced and black women, how have they informed this process specifically? Th thank you for that. Um, I, we, we had uh, s several of the black women come for the second study. We've got their testimony on how difficult it was. One of the women was 15 years old and she had no consent and they gave her a hysterectomy. And uh, it was appalling. Like I said, that, that testimony was probably some of the hardest words I've ever heard. Um, there was uh, a study that was done by jo Dr. Josephine Atawa um, in Halifax in certain areas and Senator Bernard was very helpful with this and uh, there had been a study of it was about 250 women that that uh, had been given hysterectomies and there needs to be more work there needs to be more work on on that there needs to be more work in the disability community in the intersex community I mean the the testimony that we heard in study one at the human rights committee was phenomenal it was eye opening and it's it just shows me how, how how we've just touched just barely touched on these issues that we need to do we need to have a a large overarching national body to look at look at them and um i i believe that the survivor circle for reproductive justice is 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 a good start and i think that we need to like feed into that and and keep it keep it going, keep it uh, uh, keep keep the moving, keep it moving. So I think that uh, I can't remember your first question. Well, the criminal code and and you're you're hesitating to to go into this space, right, into this right. criminal justice space, which we know isn't right. effective a lot of times and is actually worse. Senator Payton and I have talked at that, about that at length for the last 25 years, actually, <laughs> and um, and I was one that said, no, I'm I'm a I'm a healthcare professional. I don't want to see 
see this. I don't want to see this. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to see a bill like that. No, it's just going to be turned against the women. And, um, but it wasn't until, you know, the survivors are the ones who, this is the survivors. The survivors are the ones that have said, we, we need this. We need this. We want this. And the, there was no hesitation and it wasn't until I could feel it in my heart that it was the right thing to do that I could bring this bill forward and um and that's it, that's it you know like that's it we we know that that women that indigenous women have we know the stats we know that it's been difficult and and there are risks there are always risks with the criminal code but I believe that this is a very good bill and I believe it will help deter what the women have had to undergo and we may save the next generation from being sterilized. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator Klein and then Senator Klein. And then Senator Klein again. Did you say? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Senator Boyer, we've always chatted on a number of things, and today, you know, I can sense your commitment and conviction to this, and so thank you for that, and then you poured yourself into this thing. Um, under what circumstances would a patient ask for a sterilization procedure? And I say that maybe at the expense of my naivety, but I think I heard you reference something along the lines around maybe birth control, but what other purpose would there be? Okay, um, thank you. Uh, and I did want to mention that the uh, when what I was I was commissioned by the Saskatoon Health Region to to uh, have a look at their tubal ligation policies. And when I did, I told them what I thought, and uh, they immediately did enacted another sterilization policy. It was like um, like a, almost like a knee jerk reaction that the women would not be able to access a tubal ligation unless they had uh, seen their family doctor and, and you know, had the, that relationship with their family doctor and the, and the family doctor at the end decided that it was a good thing to have the tubal ligation policy. Well, I mean, in theory, that's a great idea. However, we have Indigenous women from the North that don't have a family doctor that they come down to deliver. So, I mean, they, they had the intent of of trying to make it better, but it had worse consequences for Indigenous women because um, for those reasons that Indigenous women live in remote areas. Um, indigenous women don't always go to the doctor. And, and Indigenous women do want tubal ligations, and they should have tubal ligations when they want it. And uh, they need to keep that agency, the ability to be able to know this is my body. If I want a tubal ligation, I want it. I'm going to get it. And uh, I don't want you telling me that you're going to give me one. I want to be able to control that. So, um, so that's, that's definitely, you know. Okay. So valid. I have a, another question, and it's uh, maybe the opposite end of the spectrum here. But under what, uh, or what would drive a medical practitioner to resort to uh, deception or the use of intimidation or threat, uh, force or any other form of coercion that cause or attempt to cause a person to undergo sterilization procedure, like what's driving them, what's the goal, and why would uh, others in the room stand idly by without taking action or showing concern? Well, that's, uh, thank you for asking that question. That's another really super good question um, because I've stayed up at night wondering the same thing. Uh, for many years, and what I have come up with is that um, it's the whole concept of indigenous people weren't really uh, worthy. Uh, there were wards; they had to be made. Um, uh, they had to have guardians to. They didn't really quite know how to deal with things themselves. They the racism within the healthcare system. People, the superior attitude of. Uh, of doctors sometimes, the power, the powerful versus the powerless, um, that kind of judgment call on if a woman has had, I'm going to tell you an example. Okay, so I'm checking into a hotel late at night. I'm in the West and I, uh, I'm by myself. I've got my suitcase. I'm rolling it in and there's nobody other than the clerk behind the 
the um, the desk, and I said, I'm here to check in. She said, oh, um, hello, Senator. And I said, hello. And she says, oh, you're the you're the senator of sterilization. And I said, well, I mean, that's an area that I work in, but, you know, that's, you know, I, I do work in that, and I was a bit taken aback. And she looked at me. She was a young woman, and she looked at me, and her eyes got really big, and she started to cry, and she said, they did it to me. And and I was, uh, like, I was really taken aback by this. And uh, she said, they did it to me when I was 21, and I had four children. And she said, I'm 35 right now. I have a new partner. My kids are grown, and I can't get pregnant. And I don't have the money for in vitro fertilization. And it was like, I'm, I'm holding her. She's holding me, and we're both crying. I'm thinking, oh, my God. So this is, this is why somebody would sterilize a woman at 20, 21. The second witness uh, on our second study that we had, she was 24 years old and had two children at home. They sterilized her. Why? She's indigenous. That's why. She can't because they can do it. That's why. Thank you, Senator uh, um, I have a question. I'm glad you didn't go with FGM because FGM normally happens with young girls. It's not something that happens to adult women. And there has not been one prosecution on female genital mutilation. And so I'm glad that you didn't follow that. And I had other questions, but we've almost run out of time, so I'm going to not ask you that. And Senator Odette, and then we will go to Senator Labukan Benson. Senator Odette. Mm, merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Tu n'as que me donne, Sénatrice uh, Boyer, vraiment, là, moi aussi, uh, vous êtes uh, une super femme, une super leader. Là. Puis, uh, venant uh, d'une région qu'on appelle le Québec, sachant que uh, au Québec, il y a aussi là, la professeure docteur uh, Suzy Basile qui collabore avec vous et qui travaille. Je comprends que la Cour supérieure euh, du Québec a autorisé là, récemment un recours collectif. 12 femmes à Ticamec, de l'hôpital de Joliette, même hôpital que Joyce Echaquan, qui euh, affirme avoir euh, subi là, aussi des stérilisations forcées. Et on parle juste d'un territoire, on ne parle pas juste... Je ne mentionnerai pas toutes les nations. Et... Euh, aussi, à force de vous suivre, puis, puis dans d'autres paires de mocassins, on comprend que la société d'obstétriciens, euh, le collège que vous avez mentionné, le sénateur Dalfon, des médecins, vont reconnaître qu'il y a un racisme systémique. Et euh, certains vont adhérer au principe de Joyce. Euh, comment voyez-vous, euh, avec cette nécessité, là, pour moi, ça, c'est nécessaire là, comme projet de loi, qu'on puisse faire en sorte que, des, que les mesures avec le gouvernement fédéral et les provinces, dans ce cas-ci le Québec, qu'on fasse euh, front commun euh, pour être sûr que tout le monde comprend qu'elles ont le droit de dire oui ou non dans un processus euh, protégé et ainsi de suite. Thank you. I, I do know that when I'm going out and speaking in, in groups of people, it's like seed planting. So um, I say something, you say something, she says something, and the seeds get planted. And then they say, one more woman comes forward, one more woman comes forward. And then they realize, gee, you know, I really, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have been sterilized. You know, I, I didn't really sign that. I didn't really sign a paper, and I know I'm sterilized. So um, I think that there's a, education. I mean, there's, it's a, it's a several-prong approach, like Senator Payton and I were talking. It's a several-prong approach. We need education. We need education in kindergarten, all the way up through school, and for children to know that they have autonomy over their own body, and that they can say no, and that they, they are in charge of their, their own bodies. So um, I, I have worked with Quebec at, since the beginning, since uh, Susie began, and I've been working with, um, with them every step of the way, and I'm, uh, I don't know if there's anything else that, uh, you know, that could be covered differently in Quebec. I do know that they've they've had a very difficult time recognizing that they even have racism in Quebec. So um, I'm thinking that more education, more people talking, more events, um, and and this bill passing this bill is going to help everybody. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senator Labukin Benson. And then I know senators. We have gone longer, uh, but I, I didn't want to stop Senator Boyer. So. 
I will ask uh, Senator Barris to ask her question and I'll give you two minutes and Senator Dalfour. No? Okay, merci. Uh, Senator Labuken Benson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Boyer. I'll be really quick. Uh, we know that um, historic trauma includes the intergenerational transmission of hopelessness, helplessness, and powerlessness. And how that manifests is often um, Indigenous people have a real fear of anybody with in a position of power or authority to make decisions that affect their lives. How might that affect the doctor-patient relationship and the, the doctor's capacity to actually get informed consent with an Indigenous woman or man? Um, I think that I think a lot of work needs to be done, and you're going to hear from Dr. Anjali Malhotra, and uh, she's going to cover that very uh, deeply because I've been working with the First Nations Health Authority in BC on the topic of consent and coercion and uh, policies, change, changing of policies. Just really quickly. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, oftentimes in our systems, uh, even with a law like this, the law won't necessarily be ever used but it might cause changes in the healthcare system. Hospitals will not necessarily move to protect Indigenous women, but they will protect doctors. And so in protecting doctors to make sure they get informed consent, what kinds of structures might they create in hospitals to ensure that Indigenous women have free and, fire, free and prior informed consent? Um, it'll be the policies. The po each, each hospital will have policies. And I believe that uh, uh, British Columbia is taking a lead in that area and that they're going to have a, a good template and a prototype for other provinces to follow. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Senator Babas. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to go back to, uh, given that we've, you know, you've talked about the gaps that uh, you've seen throughout years and perhaps decades about the enforcement of existing laws that we talked about earlier regarding the protection of victims of forced sterilization. Um, how do you think, Senator Boyer, your bill S-250 would concretely assure that its provisions will um, not remain unenforced? And what specific guarantees can you provide to make sure that these new measures will be effectively implemented and will offer real protection to victims as opposed to current provisions that seem not to be enforced? Thank you. I can't guarantee anything, but um, I can uh, I can assure you that th this will go throughout provincial uh, the medical associations. It will be an important document for for doctors to follow too. I think it'll it'll provide some protections for them as well. As you know, here here's where you here's what you need to do. You need to create your policies that are going to be in line with this bill and that that is very important, but I have no guarantees of anything ever. But uh, I, I can guarantee I will work, I will work at it, and, um, and I think that, uh, that, that there's going to be other people that are, that are going to be as, uh, you know, other lawyers that are working in the area, other, the medical associations, I think that provincially and federally that this will be something that will be very important for people to be aware of and to be able to help draft policies around what we have here. Thank you, Thank you Senator Boye. Thank you. For, uh, you have okay, uh, really touched us and we all feel we need to do more. And thank you so much. And we will, Senators, we will suspend now uh, for the next panel. Thank you, Senator Boye.